Hi everybody. So in today's lecture, I'd like to talk to you about spherical coordinates, and we're going to use spherical coordinates um, once we've reviewed them to find the moment of inertia for a sphere about its center of mass. So in order to get started on this, we first have to remember some definitions from cylindrical coordinates because we're going to use the cylindrical coordinates to develop our understanding of spherical coordinates. Now we covered these in a previous lecture, but just for a really quick recap, Cartesian coordinates, of course, give the coordinates for a point in terms of x, y, and z. However, in cylindrical coordinates, the coordinates given are r, theta, and z. Now remember that r is the distance from the origin to the point in question in its projection on that xy plane. Okay, so if you drop a, a perpendicular line or a, a line straight down to the xy plane from the point, then of course the z coordinate there is the same as the Cartesian coordinate z, and then r will be the projection of that point um, onto that xy plane there. So r is the distance from the origin to directly below or above that point in question. Theta is the angle that swings counterclockwise from the plus x axis to that projection r for the point's coordinates. So that's how you get back and forth. Now remember that you can link the Cartesian coordinate to the cylindrical coordinate via the equation x is equal to r cosine of theta and y is equal to r sine of theta. And that just comes from the, um, from the triangle here that you form where r is the hypotenuse, right? And then you can form a right triangle with x and y as the legs of the triangle. We also know that since r is the hypotenuse of a triangle with legs x, y, that via the Pythagorean theorem, r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Okay, now if it's been a while since Calculus 3, you might need a little refresher on the spherical coordinates. The ones that typically get used in Calc 3 uh, are rho, theta, and phi, okay? And we use those instead of the x, y, z coordinate system. And we do this mostly for problems that have spherical symmetry, like the one that we're going to do today where you're developing the moment of inertia for a sphere. Okay, so here, rho is the distance from the origin to the point in question if you draw a straight line between these two points. Phi is the angle swinging downward from the plus z axis to the line that connects the origin to the point in question. Now, if you do a projection into the xy plane of your position vector here, indicated by the line, then r is the same as cylindrical coordinates, basically, okay? And then theta is also the same as cylindrical coordinates. If you swing counterclockwise to that projection into the xy plane from the plus x axis, that's your angle theta, all right? Now, if you want to talk about limits on these values, Rho can be anywhere between zero and infinity. Phi ranges from zero to pi. In other words, phi swings all the way from the plus z axis to the minus z axis, and that's 180 degrees or pi radians in between these two. Theta starts at the plus x axis and then goes all the way back around um, the z axis, back to the plus x there, and that ranges from zero to two pi. Okay, so those are the possible values for your three coordinates. Now, if you want to look at the unit vectors, okay, so this is for spherical symmetry problems, so it's kind of easy to think of these in terms of what they would be standing here on the surface of planet Earth, okay? So if you envision yourself standing at this point right here, indicated um, at the base of these unit vectors, then you're on planet Earth. Rho hat is looking directly up, okay? Theta hat would be east, and phi hat would be south, okay? So those are your three unit vectors there. Okay, so now let's delve a little deeper into the transformation equations in between your Cartesian coordinates and your spherical coordinates. To do that, okay, let's remember this triangle. So let's go back here. I'll show you what triangle I'm talking about. The triangle that I'm talking about is along that position vector for, that points from the origin to the point in question here, indicated by this line for rho there, okay? And then that's the hypotenuse of the triangle. And then the legs of the triangle are the z component there, which goes straight down from the point in question to the xy plane. And then r, which is the same as the cylindrical coordinate, which goes from the origin 
to that point directly under the point um, right here. Okay, so that's R along there. So that's the same as your cylindrical coordinates. So that's the triangle that I'm zooming in on in this image right here. Now, we can write what R and Z are in terms of rho using this triangle. This is a right triangle, of course, okay? Now, this angle phi is indicated here. This is swinging down from the plus C axis. And via some geometry, you can see that these are two parallel lines. And so that means that uh, here's phi. This uh, angle right here would be 90 minus phi. And then this angle would be phi again, okay? So the top angle of our right triangle is phi. Now, using some trigonometry, um, I can see that R, right, which is the same as our cylindrical coordinates, that would be equal to rho sine of phi. And then z would be equal to rho cosine of phi, all right? Now, if we use our definitions of x and y from um, cylindrical coordinates, x is equal to r cosine theta, and since r is the same here, then I can plug in for our definition of r in terms of rho and phi. And that means that x, which is r cosine theta, would be rho sine of phi cosine of theta. I can do the same thing for y. Since y is equal to r sine of theta, I can plug in for r, and I end up with y is equal to rho sine of phi sine of theta. And finally, we've already got z written in terms of spherical coordinates. z is rho cosine of phi. Now, in cylindrical coordinates, we had defined r squared as x squared plus y squared. So, since from this right triangle right here, where rho is the hypotenuse and r and z are the legs, by the Pythagorean theorem, rho squared is r squared plus z squared. So if I plug in for r squared, then rho squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Okay? Now, in order to do our problem with um, developing that moment of inertia for a sphere, we're going to need to know what the volume element dv is in terms of spherical coordinates. Of course, in Cartesian coordinates, dv is just dx times dy dz, right? dx dy dz. But in spherical coordinates, we're going to have a slightly different volume element. So here's a little picture of our volume element. So if you look here and you envision this little tiny volume element as a cube, then if you know the three sides of your cube, you could multiply them together and get dv, okay? So here's a little picture of it, right? Now, if you look along this axis of the cube, which points away from the origin, okay, so it's this little guy right here, then that's just the change in rho, all right? So that's delta rho. Now, if you look at this opposite side right here, that's rho times delta phi, okay? Because if you think about it, if you start at the plus c axis, and you uh, swung down from the plus c to the minus c, you'd make the arc of a circle there. Okay, and the radius of that arc would be rho, and then you'd multiply the radius times that change in angle to find the arc length. And so that arc length would be rho times delta phi. So that makes up another side of our little uh, cube there. Now finally, you've got this other face right here. For this face, it's easier to look at the projection into the xy plane. So if you look at the projection into the xy plane of that face, then the radius to the circle that it would make would be r, but r is rho sine of phi. And then the arc length would be proportional to the change in the angle, which is delta theta. So that means that this side of the, of the cube has um, a length of rho sine of phi times delta theta, okay? And so that's here, this is rho sine of phi, and then this is delta theta right here. Okay, so rho sine of phi delta theta. Now, if you wanted to find the volume of your um, little cube, you would multiply all the sides together. So you'd have delta rho times rho delta phi times rho sine of phi delta theta, and that would give you your delta v. And then, of course, if you shrink them down even tinier to their infinitesimally small bits, then you have a differential, dv, which would be d rho times rho d phi times rho sine of phi d theta. Rearranging, we get it into its more familiar form for the volume element in spherical coordinates. And that would be dv is equal to rho squared times sine of phi times d rho d phi d theta. Okay? All right. So I think we have everything that we need now 
to prove that the moment of inertia for a solid sphere, which is spinning about its center of mass, and here I'm assuming, of course, that this is a uniform sphere, okay? We don't necessarily have to. Later on, we might do something that's non-uniform. But for now, let's just assume that we've got a nice uniform sphere here with a uniform mass here. Are we okay? And it's spinning about its own center of mass. So the moment of inertia um, is the integral of r squared dm. And here, just to remind you, r is the perpendicular distance from the rotation axis to the point in question, which is indicated here by dm, which is a little differential mass unit. Okay? Okay, now here, if it's spinning about its own center of mass, then the rotation axis would be indicated by this straight up and down line here. And then this curvy gray arrow, that would indicate the rotation. It's spinning about its own central axis, kind of like the Earth spins about its uh, line that connects the North to the South Pole, right? So that's the same idea. So that means that the distance from the rotation axis to the point in question, dm, would be the cylindrical coordinate r, right? Now r is rho sine of phi, so that's what we would plug in for r there. And then we would say the moment of inertia is equal to the integral of rho sine of phi squared, right, times dm. Remember that in a previous lecture, we developed the idea that the differential mass unit dm is equal to the mass per unit volume times dv for uniform solids, okay? So on the previous slide, we said what the differential volume is, dv, and so if you put all of that together, then we end up with dm is equal to mass over the volume, m over v, times rho squared sine of phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. Okay, so let's plug all of that in into our moment of inertia, okay? So now, since it's a volume element, we have a triple integral, okay? So what that means is that we have um, the triple integral of r squared dm, which is rho sine phi quantity squared times m over v times the differential volume unit rho squared sine of phi d rho d phi d theta. Now m over v is a constant here because it's a uniform mass density. So I can pull that out front and just leave it m over v. And then what I'm integrating over is rho to the fourth sine of phi cubed times d rho d phi d theta. Okay, so what I've done in the next step is group um, things next to the integrals in question. So I took everything that needed to be integrated for rho and I put it all together, everything that needed to be integrated for phi and put it all together, and everything that needed to be integrated for theta and put it all together. Now I can do this because these coordinates are independent of one another, so these integrals can be treated independently. So here, i is equal to m over v times the integral from 0 to r, because that's the size of our sphere. It has radius and big R, okay? So the integral from 0 to big R times rho to the fourth d rho. And then I'm going to integrate 0 to pi of sine phi cubed d phi. And then the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. Okay, now a couple of these integrals are really simple, and they can be performed quickly. So the integral of d theta is just theta. And then if I integrate um, from 0 to 2 pi, then that gives me theta evaluated between 0 and 2 pi, which is just 2 pi. So I can pull that out front as a constant. When I integrate rho to the 4th d rho, right, then I get rho to the 5th over 5. And if I evaluate that rho to the 5th over 5 between 0 and r, I end up with r to the 5th over 5. And I can pull that out front because it's now a constant. And so what I end up with is the moment of inertia is equal to 2 pi times m over v times r to the fifth over phi times the integral from 0 to pi of sine phi cubed d phi. Now the sine phi cubed integral is a little trickier than the other integrals, so I've treated it here, okay? Here's the tricky part. So the integral of sine phi cubed could be written as the integral of sine phi times sine phi squared d phi. Now, Using the identity, the trig identity, that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, I can rewrite sine squared as 1 minus cosine squared. So that gives me the integral from 0 to pi of sine of phi times 1 minus cosine of phi squared times d phi. Now to do this integral, I'm going to do a substitution. I'm going to let 
a new variable, u, equal to cosine of d. And then if I take the derivative of that, it would be du is minus sine of d. Oh, db. Sorry, that's a little typo. Anyway, so now I can plug that in, and I have the integral of negative du times 1 minus u squared. And then if I move that minus sign inside, that's u squared minus 1 du. Integrating that, I get u cubed over 3 minus u. So now um, I like to go ahead and, and do my integral and then plug my values back in and do my evaluation there. It's a little lazy, but it saves me a step. So taking that, now plugging back in, I've got cosine of d cubed over 3 minus cosine of d, and then I evaluate that from 0 to pi. Okay, so the cosine of pi is minus 1. So minus 1 cubed is still minus 1. So that gives me minus 1 third. And then minus cosine of pi is plus 1 because cosine of pi is minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. So that's minus 1 third plus 1, right? And then now I have minus uh, cosine of 0 cubed over 3 minus cosine of 0. So the cosine of 0 is 1, right? And then cubed is still 1 and then divided by 3. So that's minus 1 third minus 1 because here cosine of 0 is 1. So combining all of those things together, I get minus 1 third plus 1 minus a third plus 1. So that's basically 2 minus 2 thirds, which is 4 thirds. So this integral of sine phi cubed dc evaluated from 0 to pi equals 4 thirds. So now that I've done that integral, I can go back and plug it back in into my equation here. So I had i was equal to 2 pi times m over b times r to the fifth over 5 times the integral from 0 to pi of sine phi cubed dc. Plugging in the 4 thirds for that sine phi cubed dc integral, I end up with 2 pi times m over b times r to the fifth over 5 times 4 thirds. Okay, now plugging in for v for the sphere, it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. So I end up with the moment of inertia is equal to 2 pi times m over 4 thirds pi r cubed times r to the fifth over 5 times 4 thirds. Now there's a lot of things here that cancel out. The 4 thirds cancels out in the numerator and the denominator. The pi cancels out in the numerator and the denominator. And the r cubed in the denominator cancels out all but r squared in the numerator. So then I'm just left with 2 fifths times the mass times r squared. So we've completed our proof. That's the moment of inertia for a sphere, which is spinning about its own center of mass. OK, other than the typo, sorry for that, which I'll fix in the slides. I hope that was pretty straightforward and you understood it. And I'll see you in class.